Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Suki Kim is a Korean American writer who was born in Seoul and moved to the United States at the age of 13. Driven by her Korean roots and her family background, her uncle disappeared in the Korean War, leaving her mother and grandmother scarred for life. Suki developed a keen interest in North Korean affairs. After visiting North Korea several times and writing extensively about the country, Suki Kim landed a job as an English teacher at the newly constructed PUST or Pyongyang University of Science and Technology. Aside from the fact that it was in North Korea, funded by a Christian missionary organization, and that Suki herself was there as an undercover writer, PUST was not a regular college. All of its students were boys and happened to be the children of North Korea's highest elite. Suki Kim wrote about her experiences in her most recent book, Without You, There Is No Us, published by Crown Publishing. The book traces her life during the six months she lived on campus with 270 students, 50 of which she taught personally. She carefully describes her impressions of these young men, how she tried to broaden their horizon as much as she could, and how she felt and survived in a world of mind games and unsaids where constant propaganda, censorship, and the fear of repression so heavily weigh on one's shoulders. Without You, There Is No Us is Suki Kim's first major book of nonfiction. Her debut novel, The Interpreter, was a finalist for a Penn Hemingway Prize and was translated into five languages. She also wrote cover feature essays for Harper's Magazine and the New York Review of Books, as well as many op-eds and essays for the New York Times, Washington Post, and Wall Street Journal. She has been the recipient of several high-profile scholarships, including a Fulbright Research Grant, the Guggenheim Fellowship, and the Soros Foundation's Open Societies Fellowship. Suki Kim graduated from Barnard College with a BA in English and also studied Korean literature at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. Suki Kim, welcome to Korea and the World. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Um, your book, Without You, There Is No Us, is about your time teaching in North Korea. And it's not just documentation, it really reads as a very personal account. Uh, you speak freely about your emotions, your family background, even your relationship. So what brought you to reveal so much about you while you were writing that book? A few reasons. First of all, you know, my first book was a novel. So I, I have a background as a writer in a different way. I was never a normal journalist. Any pieces I've done about North Korea were personal essays, literary essays. So that's what I envisioned when I was writing the book. Also, the topic is very personal for me. I come from separated families on both sides of my family. So it's, it's a very personal family issue that I was born into. And I thought that was really important to address that because we look at it as a history and politics, but we don't look at it as a personal issue. And that's why, in a way, I envisioned it as a personal portrait of humanizing North Korea. And in order to do that with the students that I taught, I needed to also break the barrier between me and the reader. So I don't become just this perfect journalist, but actually a human being, quite imperfect. And also the distance between me and my subject, per se, the students also breaks down. So that was actually very intentional, why all these personal things come in so that the entire experience for the reader becomes a personal one and then the boys become real. Early in the book, you speak of your obsession with North Korea. You also uh, mentioned that when you visited Pyongyang for the first time, you felt more at home than since you had left Seoul as a child. So is it more of a personal quest than a journalistic adventure? You know, it's hard to uh, separate the two, really, as a writer. I don't think I really consider myself a full-on journalist. I was never a part of a newspaper. I think that in order to really get into the depth of the subject, you do have to uh, look at it as a personal quest. But also, I think that because I was born into it and that this wasn't really a a subject that I was going to follow for a few years, you know, the combination of everything ends up being something I pursued pretty much always. So before you took the job uh, teaching, you actually had been to North Korea several times. Uh, you actually met refugees. But when you read the book, there is this feeling that you didn't actually see something you had expected, even though you knew North Korea from before. So what was so different in your experience than from your expectations? You know, I went in there since 2002, which comes right after the arduous march, the famine. And, you know, I went in there wanting to write about it. And I did a long piece for a feature essay for the New York Review of Books. But it was still limiting because it's impossible to see what we imagine inside underneath the veil 
And each time I felt the same way. I felt like I barely saw the surface. And because also they completely control whatever they decide to show you. What I was, of course, surprised was that we do think somehow elites are far better off. We have this very Mm. black and white version, simplistic version of North Korea. And I think that's maybe what I was most surprised by. Because once you actually reach a human level, the limitations and utter deprivation of humanity, you also discover, you know, it's not just about the lack of food. And when it's lack of freedom in an intellectual, moral, or humanistic way, that depravity is in some way not that different as far as the wiping out of humanity is concerned. Did it make you um, disillusioned about the prospect of North Korea and South Korea being reunited? Because reading your book, we really have a feeling that you have somehow lost faith that that could ever happen again. Um, Was your personal dream of reunification somehow destroyed by your time You know, I think I talk about that in the book, how I feel like there is no redemption on this land. That is exactly how I felt at moments in personal fantasy. I think of reunification on some level as a fantasy. I don't, you know, I feel like I've interviewed a lot of South Koreans, especially the younger generation. Is reunification something they realistically, realistically believe in? I'm not so sure. I think my experience there, I felt like I got as far as I could in reaching my students on some personal level. And I just felt, um, you know, to be honest with you, I just didn't feel much hope because it was really, uh, I don't know, I've just never imagined such an utter control of people's basic freedom was even possible in any world. So when we talk about the fantasy of reunification, it seems a far greater wall of homework than one could possibly imagine. And all this endless lip service of six-party talks. And, <laughs> and I'm not sure where that's going or if it's going even one step closer to achieving this goal that they talk about a lot. And I say they, mostly politicians. So your conclusion seems that even if the political circumstances were right, the social divide, the cultural divide is so strong, so incompatible, that it's just never going to happen anymore. I don't know. I mean, who am I to declare one way or another? I just, I don't know politically possible how, you know, unless you break down the system of the great leader. I don't see when, you know, I'm just approaching it as a writer. And I think through the experience and having followed it so close since 2002, I think I sort of react against the hypocrisy. You know, people talk about reunification. How is that possible politically? People talk about this personal reunification, but 60 years have passed and that whole generation where it mattered most to basically died off or dying. Mm-hmm. And, and I think economically, you know, South Korea is almost in the opposite spectrum where it's just so uber capitalistic. Would they really share with North Korea? I don't know. And I think... Also education, (laughs) I think the other 100% of this control that happens in, that I observed, even if it's a limited set, even if it's the elite, I just don't see where you redo the whole thing. (laughs) When I say redo, it's almost you have to set a reset button as, as far as education is concerned. You know, people ask me some very limiting questions. They say things like, so how much about the outside world do they know? I don't think it's about that. I think it's almost like a psychology of just a completely different system. And also, you know, my students were the elite and so bright. The utter lack of just general knowledge, Mm. just general knowledge I'm talking about, you know, I'm not even talking about great leader or anything else, just knowledge about their, in their subject. It it was mind boggling to me. So where do you even begin? I don't really know where, and I don't know anyone who's really making that kind of effort on a serious level. Uh, Related to that, there is a a great uh, moment in your book when you ask them about the first North Korean satellite and they exactly know when it was launched to space, on what date, at what time. Didn't didn't the absurdity of the situation make you somehow want to laugh at some point? How how did you cope with that, that you are in front of such a wall? I mean, how how can you believe that they know so little about the world, so much about these, you know, items of... I don't think I saw it as them knowing so little. 
in the beginning, maybe when they just rattle off this great leader knowledge to you, and at some point, yes, it's it's quite mind-boggling. They would claim, do they speak Korean outside? How many of them could possibly believe that, or are they just conditioned to just say them whenever they see a foreigner? And I think this is what's kind of magical about human beings, is I think the more I spend time with them, Anytime I confronted that kind of a complete lack of knowledge, computer majors who've never heard of Steve Jobs, things like that. And my heart broke, really. If you read about that maybe in a newspaper article, you would think strange and weird. But, you know, when you confront that and if that was your kid who has so been allowed to know so little, your heart aches for them because you think, why are they being abused this way? Why should such smart, lovely college students be completely denied of any chance for education that could benefit them. (laughs) So it was more that reaction that I found really difficult on on a personal level, more and more and more, because of course, human relationship, you grow closer and closer with each day. And I think that's really with all those, I guess, quote unquote, weirdness that, for example, in the American media or the Western media, they could make fun of, you know, what they don't know in North Korea. No, it's actually... They would know, it's just their system won't let them. So it's really about sadness, really. When you were speaking to your students, were you able to draw the line between what they really do not know and what they cannot let you know that they actually know for obvious reasons? I think the boundary was always blurry. You couldn't know, you know, what they really know. And I think that's maybe that line that we were always trying to, I think I call it, it was like like a dance you are afraid to tell them more but then you want to tell them more and even if you suspect they know more you don't really want that I wouldn't open because someone else is always listening in and they even if they're curious I can't really say and some of them genuinely didn't know you know and I think that strange dance of fear really we were in a way forced to play As I got to know them, I could tell which one really didn't know, which one was pretending more. And I realized this wasn't going to get better. (laughs) Mm. That's just the way it is. But it's like that in any society. Some are more privileged and know more about the outside or more about stuff. Some are just a little bit more, sometimes like a bit more dense, possible, or just not as privileged to information. Personally, you could tell, but whatever the case was... It was really more about the fact that none of this could be talked about. And they're really not such a big deal in any normal functioning society. They should be talked about. So you did try to open them up to the world a bit. And there's a great moment in your book where you get them to watch Harry Potter. And uh, it made us think of another book by Barbara Demick in Nothing to Envy. She shares a testimony of a defector who noticed a ball pen in the jacket of a South Korean factory worker. And he thought that ball pens were only for people who had means. And so he starts, you know, questioning the North Korean system. Did you also feel some kind of reaction within the student body when they saw that movie that something may be not right here? I think a Harry Potter one was more complicated because it happened right on the day that Kim Jong-un's death was mm. announced. So I think that one, it was impossible to gauge their reaction that way. The one thing I remember thinking and that I put in the book was that they were so delighted because we had been battling with the art of writing essays, which they could not grasp Mm. because essays is about asserting your thesis and and proving it, right? Which in their system, they're not encouraged to think that way. So we have been battling with lessons on essays over and over and over And in the movie, when Harry, Hermione says, you know, we have to write an essay for, you know, Snape's class or something. And they all like roll their eyes. And that's what they really latched on to afterward, which surprised me. And they were like, they don't like essays either. And I looked at them and think, how much do they want to be a part of the world? What they saw was kind of like the way human beings are. We want to relate to others. And I think... After all that in Harry Potter's story, what they loved was the fact that the kids outside also had maybe their battles too. And I think that's kind of at the core of the book in some way, that in some way we're not that dissimilar. And maybe that's the heartache I felt always on a daily basis, every moment was that 
when you fall in love with people, they're just kind of like you, but they're trapped in that system. And that's a horrifying thought. Because it's okay if I don't think of me there, but somebody else there. But what if I'm there? <laughs> or my kid is there, and my mother is there, and my lover is there. Then the story changes. And I think I kind of felt like that. And those are the moments when they were amazed at Hermione and Harry having to write essays. They kind of were not that different from us, you know? In that sense, then it was a victory for you because they were able to bond uh, with a character that is a character of fantasy, but is, you know, an other that is not part of their system and they somehow had a relationship there. They related, which is what their system does not want them to. And in a way, we don't. Their system, you know, it's so disturbing in when you're following the in North Korea as a subject is that they don't want their people opened up, clearly. It's one thing they do not want, the regime. But, you know, we kind of play with that too. Us outside, we don't know them at all. We don't relate to them. So we have this completely bizarre way of lo- looking at North Korea where, you know, most of it is about Kim Jong-un jokes and stupid movie like The Interview. Hmm. You know, it's possible in the rest of the world somehow, even if it's a comedy or whatever. You know, I think it's, we don't, we really do think of them as the other and their pain is not our pain. We really can't relate to them. They're just weirdos, basically, which I think is exactly what North Korea wants. <laughs> so their people don't relate to the outside world. The outside does not relate. But I think like in moments like that where kids can really relate to Hermione and Ron or, you know, Harry, I think that is sort of what we want. I don't know if I can call it a victory. I mean, I think that that was always my problem being there was that I don't know if they relate, if they would be happy being stuck there. And I do truly think of them as being stuck there, even if that's their home, at least stuck in that inhumane system. I don't know. I feel mixed about that moment. So the university you were for uh, was funded by uh, missionaries. And there was this great moment in the book, The before Harry Potter, they actually favored Narnia as a movie because of its Christian message. Isn't it somehow ironic that these missionaries are attempting to preach to what is essentially already a theocracy? And very often you make this comparison that you could just switch Jesus for Kim Jong-il. It would work very well. Well, you know, they call themselves Christian educators. They, they don't claim that they are missionaries, although they have a very, 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 very strong reputation and history of having been missionaries in the region. So it's just words they use, Christian educators. The hypocrisy post as an institution was not of my interest. My interest mm. was just getting into the heart of North Korea. I know the missionaries are very mad at me for writing this book as a North Korean regime, my issue really was really is with any fundamentalism i don't care what it is i don't know i think extreme control of anything is problematic it's just the way i feel personally and i think the reason north korea is insanely scary place is because their fundamental faith in their great leader has gone out of control because it's every absolutely everything has to be under what great leader wants. And Mm. I think that these Christian educators who want to convert North Koreans in the end, in the event that North Korea opens up to another God, you know, other than Kim Jong-il, stick Jesus in there. And, and, you know, Narnia was a moment where the teachers really felt like their message would get across by showing Narnia and um, North Koreans were okay with it. But the Christian teachers Want, didn't want Harry Potter about Narnia. I mean, all of these things is about, I think, sticking their agenda, which is the absolute faith in whoever it is, you know, whether it's a Christian God or, or great leader God. Speaking about your students, did you ever feel like these elite kids might live in a state of ignorant happiness uh, that brings them little material amenities, yes, but a comfortable ideology and somehow maybe they're happy about that and somehow it's something that we have actually lost in our societies. No, no, I think it's possible. I mean, I don't think that they were deeply unhappy on a daily basis. I mean, this is the only world they've known. I don't think that it's on surface they're unhappy because their system's bad. What I wanted to just get it across was the daily absolute lack of any thing that they can do, you know, that's just a fact, you know, their daily lives were scheduled around the great leader at the age of 20 from 5am until they went to bed. 
And if that's the only world they've known and they're perfectly happy with it, that doesn't mean that's okay because there is such a thing as humanity. And also, I think my job was to get that sort of truth across to the rest of the world. And I think from that, you can glimpse what the rest of the country is. You know, there's no way I can backpack across the country of North Korea and interview everyone and deliver that truth. And even if I do that, I don't even believe that would be true because it's so staged there in every move. So the depth of writing is what I um, hope maybe you could glimpse what it would be because I think with any intelligence, one would be able to think of the rest of the picture, which is quite grim. And we get it from the defector point of view, of course, when they flee North Korea and come out. That's also one slice of the story, you know, and there is also lots of problems there as far as getting to the truth of it. So I think, you know, to the study of North Korea, if we get this picture, we get maybe other ideas about the rest of their world. This is an interesting point you make about defectors in the sense that your students told you things to make you like North Korea, and the defectors obviously have a, an interest in saying negative things about North Korea so that we help them. You know, I don't want anything to... It's a very dire uh, community that needs a lot of help. And I went, traveled all across the region from Tandong to Yanji to Samap to, you know, Mongolia, Laos, Thailand, you name it. And I've interviewed them all, whether in, you know, like in Thailand Defection Center to here when they've just come across to South Korea or the border of China. And yes, you, you get a lot of revealing portraits from that. But it is a problematic thing to cover. And I think my piece in 2010 for Harper's was all about that, the system of defecting, because there's a lot of a lot of corruption in that field with the organizations that are helping them or are covering. I mean, even media is not helping the situation. What I found was a lot of gray areas. And we've just had, you know, just the, the problem with SK from Camp 14 scandal. That's a basic problem of covering North Korea is that you can't verify the information. Hmm. And I think when human beings, when you can't verify the information, there's two things there. Sometimes you can get away with not telling the truth, right? From the storyteller's point of view. But also another part is that it's also a system of lying, North Korea itself. So, you know, we have this sort of a very uh, difficult task of how to decipher what's truth coming out of that country. It's, it's an interesting one because the impossibility of verification then also makes a lot of irresponsible journalism happen. And you, we see that constantly in coverage of North Korea. That also affects politics. And we've just seen the U.S. doing that, which is they just, you know, toughen the sanction. Based on what? Based on Sony hack. Based on mm. what? They didn't even show tell us the proof. I, so I, don't really, I don't even understand how they can just suddenly toughen the sanction against the country based on a scandal that just happened maybe like a couple of weeks before the sanction decision was made. So what I mean is the lack of verification makes a lot of irresponsible decisions happen. And I think covering defectors, that's what the problem is. Now I would like you to uh, read for us a, a very, very touching moment in your narrative about how you uh, see your students. Now, a few years later, their faces still come to me, one by one, and this motherly feeling overwhelms me. I taught them how to speak, this strange breed of children unaware of the world outside. Yet I hope they have forgotten everything I inspired in them and have grown to become soldiers of the regime. I do not want to imagine what might happen if they retained my lessons, remembered me, began questioning the system. I cannot bear the idea that any of my students, my boys who so eagerly shouted, good morning, Professor Kim, how are you? Every time I walked into the classroom might end up somewhere dark and cold in one of the gulags that exist all over North Korea. The thought keeps me awake at night still. I find this very interesting because you want to shield those students from the regime and you're a bit scared of what might happen. They, so to speak, wake up and open up to the world. But at the same time, if I may ask, isn't it even more terrifying to think that these elite students might one day be the ones committing atrocities? Because they are part of the elite. One day they will be part of you know, the state apparatus of North Korea. I really think about that. Is it better if they're just part of the elite and just 
you know, have to support their Kim Jong-un regime? Or is it that they don't get along there and they're unhappy? Someone said, like, wouldn't it be nice if they defect our country, guys can meet? And no, I think that's the worst thing that can happen, you know, because if they defect, that means something terrible had happened and they'll be separated from their families. It's the last thing that I could imagine. And I thought about that. What is the best scenario of their lives in North Korea? It's like what I said in, in that section. I'd rather they just become the soldier of their regime and at least just individually be happy <laughs> and fulfilled. And even if they have to do bad things, you know, let them do it. And I think that's because they became my kids and I don't want them to start any revolution and hurt themselves. And so somehow the system is so overwhelming that, you know, who can blame them? Just let's just hope the best for them. And I don't care if they're defectors or elite. I think that they just became really my students, so that I really adored on a daily basis. So when I really just think of their faces, I just want them to be safe. And all this ideology or politics or any of that, that just kind of stops. And I think ultimately that's the goal of the book and also what I saw, you know, people talk about the 38th parallel and who drew it, Cold War and all of this. You know, what I know of Korean War was just my grandmother crying because she couldn't see her son until the day she died. So what that meant was heartbreak for whatever, 20, 30 years she lived after the war. That is all I think about when I think about the Korean War is that human tragedy. So I think I felt like in the study of North Korea, that's what was lacking, that we don't really see it as a personal story. You do encounter tragedy when you are uh, around North Korea. At some point, you're in a bus and you see uh, skeletal people and uh, your co-worker uses the word slave. It's a very, very strong moment in the book. Didn't you feel at that moment a tension between your love for your students and the horror that you witnessed, uh, that you know the two could somehow coexist, cohabit? What I thought at that moment was because it was so, first of all, an image I was not a lot to see, really, because we passed and I saw it, but it's shielded from foreigners. And I think in that moment was pure fear. You know, I didn't relate it back to my students. They are one subsection of the society, but they're just as on some level depraved also in a different level. But this other part of the skeletal people who have to just work physically all the time, I think it was a pure horror. And I think the fact that I was allowed to teach these students, but I wasn't even allowed to see those people except in a passing glimpse outside the window. What I feared, my fear was about that regime that allows that. Like what world allows that unless those are really slaves in a prison, right? Mm -hmm. Where... Nobody else can see them except through a window glass for a second. So I think it was about what kind of world is this? I really was afraid and I didn't want to get trapped there because no matter how they want to portray, for example, Pust, a perfect propaganda tool, the school look, with very perfect looking students, that regime that allows that to be seen and to invite BBC to come in and film it and, and spread it around the world, that exact regime also hides those people, hmm. skeletal people. And I think it's about that control. That moment was about the fear of their control. Uh, moving on to the reception of the book, I think you already uh, gave us a few hints, but I'll still ask, how was the book received in South Korea? I think it's been tiring, to be honest. You know, I'm at the end of my book tour, and I, it's really nice you know, for my book to come out in my mother tongue, and this is my home. I think in America, the reception has been great. And the fact that this is a humanistic portrait of North Korea was appreciated and very much needed in the, in the study and also as a literature. And I think the fact that I'm a writer was never lost in anyone looking at the book. Here, because it's such a political issue between the conservative and the, um, the other party. So the North Korea is always a tool that gets used to assert their platform. So I feel like I've walked into a very political battle and the book constantly being exploited to trumpet their issue. What the book really is talking about gets lost. That is what I've experienced thus far. Some mm. reviews have seen it and criticized that. But I think this is why, you know, this is a very polarized society. The media is completely polarized. And the, in, on the issue of North Korea, Basically, it's hard to have a literature. 
So, you know, I think that my experience here for the past few weeks have really shown me why Korea is so divided. <laughs> you know, North and South is divided, but within this country, the division between two po- political parties and how they use the... And that's what we've had. You know, when you, whenever you, we see these tearful reunification families, little hand-picked families on the cover of newspapers here, it's usually when the political party needs that for their platform. So... I've been trying my best to stay out of it, which is not easy to do because the only media that's interested in my book here seems to be the conservative party because it helps their issue. But the opposition party don't want to bring up anything that is even remotely anti-North Korea. So for whatever it is, it's a political reception. And as a writer, I, I find that distasteful. Um, Suki Kim, to conclude, how did your perception of North Korea changed um, since you first visited it over those 10 years? Are you positive or are you... Well, actually, according to your book, you're very negative. (laughs) I'd (laughs) like to maybe maybe end on a more positive note. (laughs) What do you think? I think, um, sadly, I don't think anything really changed. In fact, I feel like it, it reaffirmed all my worst nightmare about the country. And I wish I could be more positive. You know, a lot of scholars seem to be, and sometimes I listen to them thinking maybe they're right. You know, I hope they're right. You know, I think what's so, it's interesting. In some way, North Korea, what you see is what you get. Your worst, worst thoughts about it, we see it. You know, the satellite photos or like the fact that nobody can get in and when people do get in, it's totally used to trumpet regime with the cash that the foreigners pay. You know, these absurd tours that people can go on to look at Juche Tower for three days. I mean, this great leader tour that the foreigners go in and throw in their, their dollars, which um, then, of, of course, again, feeds the regime. Basically, I think any worst suspicion is actually true, if not worse, is what I experience. And for some reason, some people don't want to believe it. And I think... It's very strange since the book came out. You know, some people write me these really angry letters and they're like, I went to North Korea, I saw everybody using the internet and I saw so many people on cell phones downloading soap opera. I hope that's true. But if that were true, I, would, I, I didn't see that, but I was probably not shown that. But even if that were true, if, if that were true, would we have North Korea as it is today? If all my students, for example, were on the internet? You know, all they have to do is just type in Kim Jong-un and they'll see everything. I mean, I just don't understand why people don't want to believe what's happening in front of them. Why is it so hard for people to believe that that is actually a horrible world in there? So I don't I don't really understand because for me, every time I've gone in, in my perception, the deeper, deeper I got, got to, it was kind of worse than what I feared. What has changed is that, no, I didn't have a human face attached to that tragedy and travesty and and heartbreak and a nightmare uh, place, the darkest place, saddest place in the world I've ever been to. But now a human face is attached to it. 50 students that I taught directly, 270 of them that I lived with. And I think having their faces attached to that place is what's changed for me, that it's become far more sadder topic in a way. Did you ever hear of or even meet any of your former students again since no, your last trip? No, absolutely or? not. No, absolutely not. And I, in a way, hope I don't because I don't see how that could be in any positive circumstances. Suki so, Kim, thank you so much for being our guest today and for your time. Thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.